Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Steinberg Hallian 7 tutorial series. I'm going to have a look at zones in detail for the first time today. And I want to take an overview episode to talk about the various different zone types. There are seven of them and how we interact with them through the zone editor. If you enjoy this series and you'd like to support my channel, check out the Patreon and YouTube channel member links below. That's an awesome way to do it. So here we are in the zone editor. If you want to follow along with this stuff, I've basically initialized an analog synth, so I can right click on the slot, init program, init analog synth. And this is what we're gonna get. We're in the zone tab here, and you can see that the oscillator section is currently highlighted and there's the little white bar to the right of it. That's no accident. This is actually part of my standard screen set. Screen sets enable you to store every level of configuration information in Hallion, not just the arrangement of the editor windows themselves, but the individual configuration options inside those editors as well. So today, in addition to giving you an overview of the seven different zone types, I'm also gonna give you an overview of how we interact with them through all of these various different configuration options. But before we dive too deep, let's just have a chat about the various zone types. I'm gonna click on this box at the top which has this image of the three sawtooth waves where it says zone type, here they all are. And we've just initialized an analog synth preset, so that's what we've got. This is a subtractive synthesizer. It has three oscillators and here they are. And they're all currently on. This is what happens when you initialize an analog synth and they're all generating sine waves. So when I press a key on the keyboard, even though you see a sine wave in the oscilloscope, what you're actually seeing there is three sine waves all added together. I'm gonna to turn oscillators two and three off, press the same key. Now it's the same sound, just quieter. Constructive interference is basically making that sound louder. This is now a single sine wave. That's what you're seeing in the oscilloscope. And down in the um, spectrum analyzer below, you can see the purity of that sine wave. Hallian is a very pure synthesis engine. In fact, it's my go-to synthesis engine when I'm performing any kind of audio analysis because there's no clutter. What you see is what you get. This is exactly a sine wave with one fundamental tone. In the next episode, we'll have a deep dive into the analog zone type and I'll show you some of the features of subtractive synthesis. But as a very quick demonstration, I'll turn this into a sawtooth wave and press a key. And here, once again, is our perfectly formed sawtooth wave. Let's have a look at another zone type. I'm gonna jump over to FM now. This stands for frequency modulation. FM synths use these things called algorithms. All of these colored boxes here define an algorithm. We're gonna be able to choose different algorithms and the DX7, the Yamaha DX7 is the most famous FM synth of all time. And you get some of the preset algorithms for free. So DX701 is the first preset in the DX7 and this is what it looks like. If I press a key now, you won't hear any sound. For reasons that we don't need to go into today, I basically need to click on number four. This is one of the individual oscillators in the FM synth. I need to give it some level. And now we hear a really simple sine wave. If I click on three and increase its level as well, no longer so simple. And this is the basis of FM synthesis, you use one oscillator to modulate another in ever increasingly complex manners. So all of these different oscillators are gonna chain into each other. They're all gonna modulate each other. And at the end of the day, this oscillator down at the bottom of the chain, which in FM is called a carrier, is gonna generate some sound and it's gonna be affected by all of these modulators above it. That's quite enough about FM synthesis for today. Whole episode there. Next along is our organ synth. And this replicates some of the features in the classic synths of yesteryear, the Hammond B3 being the most famous, but there were many classic electrical organs really before the synthesizer came along. The electric organ was how you made sound with electricity. And here we have pedals and manuals. Manual refers to something that isn't a pedal board. So on an organ, the pedals are called the pedal board and the keyboards are called manuals just one of those holdovers from historical days. And we have draw bars with which we can generate harmonics and start sounding like an organ. That's quite enough of organs, there's an episode there. So those first three zone types that we've all looked at 
are based on generative oscillators. They all have some sort of oscillator engine inside them that's going to generate a tone that's going to be amplified. And that's why we've looked at those three first. The fourth zone type to introduce you to is the sample zone. So let's select one of those. And again, I'm going to press a key and you're going to hear absolutely nothing at all. In order for you to hear sound out of a sample zone, you have to load a sample into the sample editor. Now up in Cubase above, you can see that I've already loaded a sample called 32C-7 Lead AM, beautiful title. You should be able to find that yourself in the media bay if you want to follow along exactly, but any old sample will do. I'm gonna pick this sample up and I'm gonna drop it where it says very helpfully, drop sample here. Now that sample has been loaded into memory. Now, when I press a key on the keyboard, we hear a C minor seven chord. The sample zone is kind of a pure zone. It's dedicated to playing samples. It does that thing very well, and there's no fluff or overhead to it. And surprise, surprise, we'll be spending an episode on the sample editor. But you can take the concept of, of sample playback much further, and the next zone type along does that. The grain zone type is also based on samples, and notice what happens when I switch to grain zone. The sample that I loaded uh, into the sample player, into the sample zone, has stayed behind. Hallium will be as intelligent as it can possibly be. If you change from one zone type to another, it'll retain as many settings as it can. So now I'm in a granular zone. Now the concept of grains is a little bit esoteric and yes indeed that's another episode entirely in its own right there but just as a very quick introduction what it basically does is it takes tiny snapshots of sound of the samples called grains and this is basically the fundamental principle of spectral analysis when you analyze a spectrum if you want to see something like in the spectrum analyzer there's a process that gets carried out called a Fourier transform and behind the scenes, the algorithm uses these little windows to view these snapshots of sound. Each one of those little snapshots is called a grain. And in a granular synthesizer, you get to manipulate those grains in really freaky ways. Now, it's very quiet. I'll turn it up a little bit. Get this really kind of nasal sound. What's happening there is the beginning of this sample is being played over and over again, not the entire sample, just the beginning of it. And then we're able to introduce concepts like direction, which is gonna require me, as I've just discovered, to turn my volume back down. And now snapshots of that sample are being played. And you can see all of these white lines, they're the individual grains. Imagine multiple playheads on a tape machine. That's what's happening here. And we'll be able to do tons of really interesting manipulation on those grains using this sample in the grain zone. Next along is the spectral zone. This is yet another view of a sample editor. So we've retained the same sample in the background. We still have our C minor seven sample loaded, but now we've taken a spectral view. And this is very similar to what happens in a spectrum analyzer. What you're seeing here with all of these colors is a frequency distribution over time of the relative amplitudes of all of the harmonics of that sample. So over the course of time, as the sample plays, how loud is each individual harmonic? And you get this color map. So the brightest colors are where any particular frequency is the most dominant. And this spectral map describes the journey of that sample over time as all of the various harmonics decay and the sound disappears to silence. But fundamentally, it's the same sample being played. I'll press the same key again. There's the sample. And you can see this playhead traveling through the spectrum, the spectral graph. And again, we'll be able to manipulate that in cool and interesting ways. So those are your three primary sample players. Then the seventh category, which really stands on its own, is the wavetable. And this is a funny old beast. The wavetable does use samples, and once again, it's tried, Hallian has tried its very best to take that C minus seven sample that we initially loaded but now it's loaded it into a wavetable. Wavetable has its own editor, here it is. And at the moment we only have a single entry in our wavetable. I'm not gonna ask you to worry too much about what's going on now, but I'm just gonna click on this box that says number of waves. And it's literally slicing that sample up 
and taking snapshots of it and generating all of these different entries in its wave table. And that's going to generate a different sound again. And that's what a wavetable version of that sample sounds like. Let's complete the circular journey and finish off back at the synth zone because this is the simplest. And Hallian has remembered that the last thing I did with a synth zone was to select the sawtooth. So it's got all of these internal memories, everything that you do on a preset while you're fiddling around and changing all of these zones and changing all of the values. Everything is stored behind the scenes and Hallian will do its very best when you jump back to something that you've been to previously to recreate that situation as accurately as it can. And here we have our sawtooth wave. Let's have a look at the editor itself. You see this row of information at the top telling me uh, the range of key zones and velocity splits. That might not be visible to you. There's a little blue eye button that says show zone info bar. If I turn that off, that bar will disappear. So that's how we get to it. And that's showing me that this particular zone is operating across the entire keyboard. If I loaded, for instance, our favorite hexagon preset, some of the individual zones in this program are constrained in their key splits. So if we have a look at the studio strings layer, which is a sample based collection, here are all of the individual samples. I click on C2, for instance. Now you can see that the range of uh, keys to which this sample is mapped is just C2 to C sharp 2. You can also see that there's some context specific information here. If you have a sample loaded, Hallian will give you information about that sample. A lot of this information is actually stored in the sample itself. Uh, a WAV file can store quite a lot of metadata about itself, and that's what you're seeing here. I'm going to right click on the slot and get back to my simple analog synth. And you can see that because I've reinitialized it, it's got me back to that beginning situation with my three sine waves. That's okay, that's fine. Next to the info bar button, we have a mute button. So this allows me to mute the entire zone. I'm just going to duplicate this zone, right click, copy, right click, paste. And I'm going to rename these two zones, zone one, right click, rename, zone two. Whichever one of these zones I click on, that's the one I'm currently editing. So if I mute zone two, there you can see the mute symbols just come on in the program tree. To the right of the mute zone uh, symbol, we have Hallian 3 compatibility. I discussed this in a previous episode and I don't worry about Hallian 3 compatibility, but if you load a preset that is compatible with, the, with Hallian 3, then this is where you'd see it. I'm not gonna worry about it in this series. The next button along though is very important. This allows us to switch between relative and absolute editing. And this is why I've created myself a second zone. I'm gonna unmute zone two and do a little bit of configuration so that we can hear both of these zones simultaneously. I'm gonna turn zone one into a triangle. Just wanna hear it on its own for the moment. Turn the level up a bit. So the level of the triangle zone has now been set to Let's make it exactly 50. Zone two, I want to be a single sawtooth wave. And I'm gonna set its level to 20. Now let's hear both of those zones together. So it's the triangle plus the saw. Have a look at it in the oscilloscope, that's what we get. Now I can demonstrate the difference between relative and absolute. I'm going to select the layer some stuff just turned red. Anything that's red is information that's different between the child zones in this layer. So you can see that the oscilloscope shape has changed red because zone one's a triangle and zone two's a saw. And I've also set different levels. Can you also see this arc? This is called a corona around the knob from three o'clock up to 12 o'clock, from 20 up to 50. That's telling you the range of different values that are assigned to the level controls in the zones inside this layer. Now we're in relative editing mode here. I'm going to adjust this level knob a quarter turn clockwise. Here we go. See that corona tracked with the, uh, with the, the level knob. Now I'm going to select each of the individual zones. Here's zone one at three o'clock. What's its value? 82. The relative difference between those two controls has been retained. 
That's what relative editing does. Now I'm going to switch to absolute mode, head back up to my layer. Now I'm going to pull this control back to 12. Now all of those colors have disappeared. See that, that, red, um, that red corona has disappeared. That's because every zone inside this layer has been set to exactly this level. And because there's no longer any difference between the various levels, it doesn't need to be painted red anymore. We can confirm that by selecting each of the zones and you can see that they're both set to exactly 50. So this is a really important control to understand. It's going to fundamentally affect how you interact with Halion, understanding how the absolute control works. It's worth saying if I have exactly zone two selected and I change this level, I'll change the level to zero, jump back up to zone one, Zone one's been left completely alone. If I have a single zone selected, only that thing gets changed. But if I jump up to the parent layer and make a change, now every zone underneath it has been set to exactly that value. Let's have a bit more of an examination of that corona though, because there's still more stuff to go. I'm gonna set zone one to 20 and zone two is still at 50. Jump back up to the layer. Here's our Corona back. This time I'm gonna click on the Corona itself. So I'm gonna hover over that red arc. You see it's highlighting, it's basically lighting up every time I hover over it. Now I've hovered over it, I'm gonna click and then drag up. And now you can see me making that Corona bigger. Let's have a look at the two zones underneath. Zone one's at the lower limit of that Corona and zone two is at the upper limit upper limit. So I've basically expanded that range by clicking on the Corona itself. Select it again. This time I'll drag down. Now I'm shrinking the Corona. Pretty obvious what's going to happen there. There are two more um, functions that we can perform as well on the Corona itself. This time I'm going to press the Alt key on my keyboard, drag up. Now I'm just editing the starting level or press control, now I'm just editing the right hand level. So we have a lot of flexibility over the relative ranges of all of the zones underneath your current level by interacting with this thing. Now everything that we've done so far in this screen has been on this single section, the oscillator section, but there are multiple sections in the zone editor and they're all represented by these icons at the top of the screen. I'm gonna simplify this sound a little bit by muting the triangle zone. And we're just gonna concentrate on zone two, which is the sawtooth. So if I click on any one of the sections that's not currently highlighted, I'm gonna click on this one that says filter section. The filter section has just appeared. Here it is down at the bottom. At the moment, we don't have a filter engaged, so it's not particularly interesting. I'm gonna click this little box that says filter type and give myself a classic filter. Now here is my filter. I have a cutoff value where I can affect, you can see me affecting the frequency of the audible waves. Don't worry about the detail, we'll deal with all of that later. But I've now got two different sections open, the filter section and the oscillator section up at the top. This little white bar means that the oscillator section is locked. It's always gonna be visible regardless of anything else I click. So if I now click this envelope section instead, the filter section is gonna turn off because that's not locked and we'll see the envelope section instead. Here's the oscillator still open and now we can see the envelope section. So quick demo of the envelope section. I've just introduced a tack to the note which means every time I press a key it takes a little bit longer to get to full volume. There it is, it's taking nearly half a second to get to full volume now. Let's lock the envelope section by clicking its little white button. See, it's very difficult to see, but it's just to the right of the section. It says lock, and now the envelope section is locked. So oscillator and envelope are always gonna be visible regardless of what other sections I click. And you can see me toggling between all of the other sections, but oscillator and envelope are always open. If I wanna see absolutely everything that the zone editor has to offer all simultaneously, I can. To the right of the zone type button, it's black on black, so it's very difficult to see, but there's a show all sections marker here. There's a little button that I can click. 
and this is a toggle button. So it's now toggled everything off except a single section, in this case, the oscillator section. And I click it again, it turns every single section on and it's locked them all. See, every lock symbol has just come on. So we either disengage every lock or engage every lock. So let's simplify everything down. I clicked lots of buttons there. I wasn't really expecting you to follow along with that exactly. I'm just gonna click this button again to shut everything down. And now we're back to a single section. The reason why it's a different single section this time is that that was the, the leftmost of all of the sections that were open when I pressed that button. So Hallian will basically say, oh, you were looking at those four things. You've toggled everything off. I'll show you the leftmost of the ones that you were last looking at. Let's go back to the oscillator section again. Comfortable, familiar territory. The last thing that I want to introduce you to today is the concept of modulation assignment rows. Underneath every section, here's the oscillator section. We have this thing called OSCMOD. This is a dedicated modulation, modulation section. This is a, a new feature of Halion 7 that wasn't in the 6, where you get to see basically like a shortcut or an abbreviated version of anything that's currently acting as a modulator on the oscillator. Now modulation is a very big subject and it's way too big to cover in any detail today, but I'm gonna show you one very quick example of how to make a modulation assignment. In this oscillator modulation section, I'm gonna drop down this little arrow and I'm gonna say oscillator one pitch is going to be modulated by, got this little plus button here that says add modulation and I'm going to assign it to a low frequency oscillator. Let's not worry about how or why. This is just a demonstration of these modulation rows. The modulation value is currently zero. So when I press a key, you don't hear any modulation. But if I increase this modulation amount to a non-zero value, that's an oscillator, a low frequency oscillator, modulating the pitch of oscillator one periodically and you can see this abbreviated view of that modulation in the modulation row these little plus and minus buttons which is yet another way of abbreviating the stuff that we can see so if i open multiple sections to demonstrate how these work so i've just locked three sections open now i can scroll up and down with my mouse wheel and you can see all of this various information each one of these little mini sections can be opened or closed by pressing the corresponding button. And every time I click one of the plus buttons, you can see that everything else gets shrunk. We can only see a single section at a time. If I press the shift key down on my keyboard and click one of these plus buttons, everything opens. And now everything that's visible, every section that has information in it is gonna get opened. Press shift again, and they all close down. If I want to open just the oscillator and filter sections and leave everything else minimized, I press the control key. So here's me pressing the control key now. I'll open the oscillator and the filter. And now both of those uh, sections are open simultaneously. Now this is a bit clunky. If I single click on this oscillator section, I'm just gonna click on this little minus button here. You'd expect oscillator to collapse, but it won't. It's basically like a toggle button that closes all of the other sections down. So now just oscillator is visible. And now if I click it again, finally, it'll be minimized. And then there's me toggling on and off with the oscillator section. So these plus and minus buttons are a law unto themselves. And once again, take a little bit of time getting used to. This zone editor is really, really deep. There is an awful lot of information on display in this window and it's worthwhile spending a little bit of time getting used to the interface and figuring out how all of these components hang together. Right, that'll do us for today. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Please hit like if you did. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.